Now, you see, I don't think that we really should be letting them retire. I mean, as we've seen today, being young may give you a little speed, but that's doing more harm than good when you don't know where you're going, or you don't know which end of the sword is the pointy one, like that lad over there. You see him. Yes, strike with the handle. Very sharp, isn't it? How's your hand feeling, by the way? Idiot. I need to have words with his officer if we're letting these morons take our coin. Might as well just offer it to Mars instead. And look at those horsemen. They can barely sit up straight. Excuse me, Centurion. Tell your men that the shield goes between you and the enemy. They're flinging it around like a damn fishing net. How are you going to win me a consulship like that? Another one, that is. I think I'll make a fine co-consul for myself. And if the Senate want to be so childish about it as to make it a literal contest, then I'm happy to lower myself to being equally childish about it. If we let Aurelianus win, where will we be then? He's already basically consul of his little bit, and I have mine. The Senate wants both of us to rule both bits at the same time. A little pointless, to put it generously. Speaking of which, look at how he's using that spear. Pointy end in front. You there? Yes, you. Pointy end in front. It's a weapon, not a broom. Hello and welcome back to Fields of Mars. Last time, we were able to clear out a load of Sassanids near Alexandria, then headed over to help our Egyptian allies by fighting the Garamantians. We managed to get a relatively ordinary land battle that was a special treat where we wiped out some Garamantian infantry without much help from Egypt. Septimus was able to make some gains by reforming the Roman state of Asia to protect Thracia. Constance then went back to the Alexandria region and just cut down even more Sassanids, clearing up their most recent invasion, and then we jumped over to see Aurelianus, where he was suddenly moving out against the Huns on the promise from the Senate of receiving political favours if he could take out Attila. We had a very favourable battle that went exactly right against their first army, and now we continue on. First, we've got a bit of business in Egypt to attend to, and we've got some agent trouble specifically. Constans losing most of his movement points at a very annoying time because we're actually surrounded by enemies right now. The Garamantians coming for our settlement down there in the south, the Oxyrhynchus, I think it's called, and generally coming as if they're going for Alexandria. They seem to be just walking right past Egypt right now and coming into our territory, perhaps stirred up by the fact that we were fighting them over in Egypt's territory. So with limited movement points, we can't really do anything about them right now. We'll just have to be on the defensive. Meanwhile, we've got our Hun hunt to attend to. So Aurelianus happens to be in movement range right now of this group of Hun armies. Attila himself with a half-dead unit and a half-dead army sitting in the middle. So I could attack them right now, but they'd still have about two stacks worth of troops, which could be challenging. However, Julianus, who surely wants to get in on the action as well, is also in reinforcement range. He can't quite reach the armies, but he can get to a point where he's close enough that if Aurelianus attacks, he'll be able to tag along. So seeing this, I'm going to move him over. This will, of course, leave our defences open because the Huns could now move through Aquilia into Italia and attack anything they like, but they may not know to actually do that. So I sent Aurelianus to attack Attila himself, and I thought we'd have a battle here, but they actually ran away. And since they ran away in the strongest possible configuration, that means they'll also run away when I attack the other two armies, and there we go. So nothing came of that in the end, we'll just have to continue watching. And because we're actually going into winter next turn, these armies are going to be pretty much stuck due to winter attrition. So the uh, hunt will have to wait until spring now. Back in Egypt, I wanted to start a new small army to support Konstan, so I've got a Senate officer actually to come down and basically just recruit a few troops so that we can either support Konstan's attacking things or have them be on the defensive so Konstan's can be freed up to be a little bit more aggressive since we're being attacked from all sides all the time. And those attacks are happening right now. Some Sassanids appear from the south. I had thought the Sassanids had nothing down south, up upriver on the Nile, and I think they actually moved things down 
one there might have seen them moving troops down the road on the other side of the Nile. So for whatever reason, they're just doing a roundabout attack on us to come up from the south. The Huns run away, uh, going deep into their territory, but we can still see them because they ran into range of one of my spies, so that's quite nice. We'll keep an eye on them and make sure, of course, they don't now go and exploit our open defences. And the Garamantians start pushing on Alexandria. They seem to attack Egypt first and easily defeat them because there's nothing there. And then they actually go and lay siege to Alexandria and stack up with a few extra forces to add to that siege. Then a Lachmid agent makes very short work of that new officer from the Senate. He is immediately killed before he could recruit any troops so that didn't go very well this is basically what happens when you're at war with the eastern coalition they have so many more agents than you that they will just spam agents and do whatever they want basically so that's just going to be an ongoing problem so there's all the messages we got betrayed by that agent basically we've also got some wavering loyalty to deal with with some governor back in britannia but that'll be easy enough we'll just give him some promotion to some office now i was looking at the garamantian force besieging alexandria and it looked curiously weak we of course have constans inside the city so he can just sally with the garrison which is pretty big and with the fleet which is full-sized as well so doing that basically makes them break the siege and run away so this simulation is basically representing nothing coming of this siege. They walked up to the town, saw we were strong, and walked away again. However, it still counts as damaging all the buildings, as if the siege had been going for a while and they'd been making siege attacks, which is a really annoying little feature of the sieges in this game. Anyway, so we basically chased away all of the Garamantian armies nearby, and none of them wanted to fight. They all just ran away. So we've scattered them, but not actually damaged them in any way. They can just come back again. There goes another one. I have enough movement points to reach a couple of them again, so I had the chance here to try and actually kill some of these armies at least and start working our way through the Garamantians. And I'm going to go for this one on the riverside because the naval fleet can come upriver and actually take part in this fight. And we have a gigantic advantage as a result. So we'll just order to resolve this guy away. A nice high level commander who we can just very quickly kill. Constance just pokes him with his sword, kills a decent amount of the army, but not all of it. However, it did just retreat, so we will be getting rid of them. That's very nice. They do still, of course, have those armies over to the west, so we need to go back to Alexandria to defend against them. They'll probably be making some more attacks. And, of course, they weren't the only threat. The Sassanids are still here, and they are going to attack us again. Once again, they want to sack this settlement, coming in with a super easy order resolve that we can't really do anything against, so we'll just let them do it. For some reason, they're not reoccupying this settlement. They just keep sacking it over and over again, which does have diminishing returns, so they're not really getting anything out of this apart from making a statement in that they keep beating us in battles. Maybe Maybe that's their objective. I appreciate the sentiment. I really do. I was ready to give control over to your man as soon as I'd done saying my goodbyes. But you see, it wasn't so easy, for we were under siege by the enemies you made in Africa, and I couldn't meet him for some days. And when I went to hand over the reins, I found, to my horror, that the dastardly Easterners had strung him up in the desert with all the men he had gathered. Yes, he is dead, honourable gentlemen. It's very volatile out here. You are welcome to send another representative, and I'd be happy to give all my forces over to you. But I think you'll find the same thing will happen to him again. Such is the way of the desert. My advice, if you want it, is to stick to ruling my old conquests, and let me deal with the new ones. In the next turn, the Garamantians were back to resume their siege of Alexandria, this time with the sieging force not even in reinforcement range of the other Garamantian army, so it was just half a stack laying siege. Really annoying, again, for the reason I mentioned earlier, because now it's damaged all the buildings once again, and this is just something which never would have had any chance of getting near the city if we'd had a chance to react to it before our turn. But anyway, we went over to the west to destroy the other Garamantian armies, and they are going to stand and fight because they are together. The first army, not very good at all. Tons of levy, deserty style troops which have poor equipment and training. And what we can do is use Constanz's night attack ability to get rid of the second army, to bring it out of this fight. And although we'll lose half a stack of garrison troops, it still means the balance bar is super far in our favour because the enemy's troop quality is so poor. So seeing this, I thought we'll just ought to resolve that first stack. 
no problem to get a really good result there. Most of the army destroyed is still alive with most of its units, but they're all super damaged and Constans taking relatively light damage in comparison and taking on warriors will mitigate that damage. They're going to be moving into Egyptian territory so they won't replenish, but that doesn't really matter because I thought we might as well go finish them off, simply because that second army isn't really going to be enough to do any harm on its own. It can't take Alexandria from the garrison, especially if I put the fleet into docks there, as I am doing. So now thinking that we're pretty safe, I'm just going to move over to the west and attack these guys again. Another super easy order to resolve. So that just gets rid of them, and now the Garamantians are down to just one frontline army. Now, with the Snows finally gone, Julianas and Aurelianas are going to continue chasing after the Huns. Unfortunately, we can't reach them right now, so we can still see that little group with Attila in it, but it's out of reach. So I'm just moving up to the edge of the snow line here to basically be near them, reduce their opportunities for movement, and hopefully be able to catch them next turn. Although it's lucky I did have this spy on hand because I moved the spy over here and we actually discover that the Huns have more armies in the area just behind the forest and some of these guys have sufficient movement range to come and attack Julianus and Aurelianus where they've just stopped moving and they could team up of course with the nearest axe to suddenly overwhelm us potentially at least so seeing that I'm just going to shuffle backwards slightly now I thought that would put me out of their movement range but of course the only reason it said their movement range was right up to where I was is because my own zone of control was blocking their movement range so I was being a little bit stupid there and will be punished for that in a second the assassins go and take that settlement there with no fight because there was no garrison after they sacked it so many times and then indeed the Huns come over for a fight of course they can still reach us as I mentioned and we get this fight going now annoyingly Attila managed not to come into this fight I don't know where he went he's not where he was before but basically he wasn't involved in the battle and that means we basically don't have much of an incentive to actually fight it it's an even balance bar since we have two stacks on our side so I think we have a decent chance but I ended up saying there's no point fighting this because if we can defeat Attila most of these stacks will actually just disappear so there's no point killing them first since you might as well see if they survive after Attila's gone so once we retreat with one army Attila does now reappear just to mock me leading the attack so I could have fought that and basically fought to the death to try and take out Attila but that's not exactly what we need here we need to come out of this alone Alive, if possible so we fall back again both our armies falling back to a strange position but at least they're next to each other and then the Huns just move around the place with Attila looking relatively isolated now possible we can attack him at least he's still on the front line now the Garamantians, after we wiped out all of their armies over in Egypt, come to us offering peace and money to make it go down a little bit easier. So this is just what we need. We're not in a position to actually attack them, so we might as well be at peace. We're not going to gain anything from being at war. The only thing I did want was to ask for a little bit more money since they had annoyed me and they were willing to accept that deal. So that is a great result. That will take the pressure off Constance. Now he can focus on the Assassinids and perhaps one day try and get that territory back that we just lost. But first back over to the Hun situation where you can see the Illyrian forces have moved out and attacked some of the Huns and caused their armies to move around a bit which is actually a little bit annoying. Attila is now much further away than he was before and another Hun army has apparently retreated to be standing right next to Julianus and Aurelianus. So now I have to attack it to move through. Luckily, it's half dead, so that's no problem. Had to fall back with Aurelianus there, though, because Julianus wasn't reinforcing for some reason, even though I'm pretty sure he was in reinforcement range. I guess he just wanted to have the honor of leading this attack since it was going to be virtually a guaranteed victory. He can get that on his resume, and it goes easily enough, so we destroy that army. That will allow us to move off this little peninsula. But of course, we can't attack Attila anymore. I think we might have not been able to reach him anyway, but now he's so far away, we're going to have to just go back into chasing him and trying to get into position once again. Picking up a couple of upgrades before we go. So we'll just have to see what all these Huns do. They're all over the place now, so it's going to be dangerous to move through this territory. But if we stick both armies together, even if we do get forced into a fight, at least we'll have pretty good chances. Now, the Sassanids suddenly decide to make an attack at Constantinople. I wasn't really sure why they weren't doing this before. I was expecting them to, but I think Constance's attack in Egypt basically heavily distracted them and many of their forces went down there instead. However, they didn't actually want to make that attack on Constantinople. They laid siege and then left immediately so I guess they just saw Septimus in there maybe they didn't know what we had defending it or something and gave up once they saw the balance bar who knows 
Now the Huns go and completely wipe out the Illyrian field armies there, as you might expect. And this actually goes really badly for us, because you can see this, the arrangement of the armies now is such that Attila, although he has basically no troops himself, is surrounded by all the other armies. So we can't really get close to him very easily now, and that's going to make it super hard to hunt him down. We need to wait now for the configuration to change up in some way, and basically just wait for Attila to get on his own and not be surrounded by countless infinitely respawning bodies guards which may indeed be a long wait. The Senate wants nothing more than a chance to get you into their little lair, then it will be all knives and blood. Best avoid it really. Is that so? Oh, quite so. They're nasty people, most of them. Jealous, blithering, rather soft on non-Romans I find. But they do what they are told. Will you stop this now? I have my own spies in Rome, you know. They are nothing more dangerous than a group of elderly men with very little information on which to base their decisions, a trait they have in common with most rulers. And I know for a fact that they consider you to be a dolt of the lowest concern. You've painted quite a comforting picture of it all for yourself, I see. Well, so be it. You'll feel much better for your failings if you think that, and I won't deny you such ease. Next, the Sassanids wanted to retry their siege of Constantinopolis, coming at us over land and over sea. But once again, once they arrived, they decided they weren't going to do that and promptly ran away. So I don't know what their plan is. I guess they need to get more forces, but they can't be bothered to move the stack standing right there to come and join the siege. So they just give up on it. Anyway, we also see the Huns moving lots of their forces over towards the northwest and disappearing out of view. And there is one of their respawned stacks. They respawn in the top right hand corner of the map. So it's it takes them a couple of turns to walk across the map to get to you, so that's the little leeway you have after defeating their armies, but soon they shall arrive. So I moved the spy to look at all the Hun armies. They're basically now pretty out of reach from where Julianus and Aurelianus are standing, plus they're now behind all the snow, so we'll take attrition if we even move towards them a little bit. So overall, not good. The wait shall have to continue. We'll just move along the edges of the coast here where we can avoid attrition and get a tiny bit closer. But overall, looks like we're really not any nearer to finding Attila than we were before. Now, his army seemed to go back, except his. He rushes further to the north, now going even further away and truly going out of our reach. Plus, that respawning army actually walks right into Thracia, so that's inconvenient. It looks like we may have some trouble on our hands there. I tried to find Attila again using my scout, but I was unable to do so. Moving north, I found another Hun army, but no sign of Attila. He's disappeared off somewhere. So now we've basically lost the trail. He's nowhere near us and we don't know where he is, so we can't go towards him. And as we've said many times, there's no point going after these other Hun armies because it's not going to achieve anything. So it seems our hunt is just suddenly fading away now. Some good news, though, is that the Sassanids have once again abandoned Nicomedia, so Septimus can just step outside and fight their garrison army with an easy auto resolve. So that is nice, and this time we are going to make a different decision to what we've done previously. Uh, Septimus is going to basically have to swallow his pride and realize that just sacking Nicomedia doesn't do anything. It's not going to have any long term impact on the Sassanids, but what we can do, of course, is raise the settlement a tactical raising. Since we can't hold it as evidenced in the past, We'll just make sure that they can't hold it either by getting rid of it entirely. So that'll make it slightly harder for the Sassanids to attack Thracia and Constantinopolis and may make them wish to rebuild it before they do, which will buy us some time if that is still their plan. Septimus, of course, is now stuck there because doing that uses all your movement points, so he is likely to get attacked by the Sassanids. And there's that Hun army just sneaking through our back lines. The question is, is it just going to walk through or are they actually going to be aggressive? Because they could probably take Marcinopolis there if they really wanted. Now the Sassanids of course do come to attack Septimus, they do not allow us to step anywhere near them, and the balance bar actually in our favour, they've only got one and a half stacks of troops, they probably could have mustered more if they really wanted, lots of ranged units here, so I was going to fight this, but then I basically realised that it's not going to achieve anything, it's similar to fighting the Huns where we can defeat these armies, but what would happen if we did? Pretty much nothing and they'd just come back, so I thought we'll save everyone's time by trying to avoid the battle, I thought I'd just get a retreat back into Constantinople but Septimus actually runs past the enemy and does this weird thing running into our Asian allies territory. Luckily that's good enough for this turn, at least the Sassanids can't pursue. 
They're also there gathering some fleets, or trying to gather fleets near Alexandria, but they're stuck, not realising they can't actually sail into the Mediterranean from there, so that's all nice. And the Huns continue their movements with their army in Thracia, apparently just walking past us, which is exactly what we needed, so that's all well and good. Now, Constans has, during this time, basically been facing off against a building rebellion, which is now at full strength, bringing tons of siege equipment to attack Alexandria. Luckily, we have tons of forces to counter them, so we can just order us all the way their siege assault that was very misguided from the enemy. And then, a couple of turns later, actually, after not much happened, we got this little cutscene that seemed to tell us that doom was approaching, there was a solar eclipse going on, and something about the sixth seal of the apocalypse being opened or something. I thought, well, this is probably going to be 20 more Hun stacks are going to spawn or something. But it actually turned out to be an entirely different set of news, both good and bad. The bad was that this eclipse seemed to be marking the death of Constans. Legio II is his army, you can see on the right there, that he has died of natural causes. So for now, his army will just be taken over by some minor officer from the Senate before we can arrange a superior candidate. And there's the confirmation, natural causes. In his 60s, so he lived a decent life and a life of conquest and glory. He basically single-handedly restored a decent chunk of the empire, so he's going to be remembered fondly. And here is some perhaps even more important news. Attila has somewhere died. And so we don't know where he went on his little quest there, but he managed to get himself killed. It's possible he died of old age. He wasn't that old. He must have only been in his 40s at this point. But it also comes along with a famine, because there's been some more climate change with the passing of Attila, and this basically means we're now going to have less food income from everywhere because fertility levels drop as the temperatures are dropping. And so we've gone right food negative after having a pretty good food surplus before. So we're going to have to deal with that, deal with the loss of Constans, and perhaps somewhere in between celebrate the death of Attila. Don't you see? Don't you comprehend his message? We have failed the Lord. These signs do not mark the passage of great men. They mark another rung on the ladder to hell. The Lord sees that we do not rid ourselves of heathens, and so he steps in to remove the two most demonic men of this world, casting shadow across the land as he does so, to show the darkness in their souls, and restoring the light with their passing, so that we might realize there is still hope. The trial is not over, but we are losing, friends. Losing our connection to God. We have brought all this suffering upon ourselves with our unending sin, with our unending cowardice in the face of ignorance. Where God's word has been scorned, his actions shall not be. We must teach mankind of the end they bait and save them. With Constans dead, his wife Pompilia, who is also Aurelianus' daughter, is now once again widowed, but immediately seems to be lining up a new potential husband. It's now up to Septimus, as the head of the family, to make a decision on this, but the man she wants to marry is also called Septimus, and also looks pretty much identical to him. So I decided he might as well intervene here, deciding that this was going to be a little bit weird to have another identical Septimus added to the family. Plus, of course, we don't even know who he is. We may be able to get a more favourable marriage in the future if we just hold out a little bit. Now, if anyone was wondering what happened to Eutropius, here he is. His current duty is basically taking over from what Tranquilius used to be doing, which is just holding down all of the islands and generally being responsible for all of the Mediterranean at this point, since Julianus has abandoned Italia as well. So that really just means fighting rebels and taking out these eastern armies that come over and land from time to time, but so far that's not been a problem. Now, with Constance's main force, I decided that his son Anicius, the one who's currently gov governing in Constantinopolis, is going to sneak down to claim his right to rule this army, since Septimus already has his own force, as the second son, Anicius, may inherit command of this force. 
the first thing he's going to do with it is try and win some glory by taking back that settlement we lost to the Sassanids a long while back now. But it's going to be a little bit of a problem because he's not a particularly good commander. We saw just earlier when I was picking him, he's boring, he's arrogant, and he's a procrastinator. So overall, not exactly leadership material. Also noting there that our Egyptian allies have been taken over by separatists, but at least they're not hostile to us. So that's not actually a massive difference. Now, Julianus is going to detect a, a chance for glory here because with the death of Attila most of the Hun forces have now disappeared and I'm using my spy to basically confirm that they've been cut down to perhaps a quarter of their previous strength in terms of the number of armies just hanging around a couple of the armies are already looking like they're going to go on the offensive against us with one besieging that rebel town of Sirmium and another coming down our way and then in the unturned sequence another one appears from over in the east and links up with some more armies coming from the north and basically we end up with this situation it's about two and a half armies attacking our backup army which is just inferior troops hanging around Aurelianus is nearby and they fortunately can't come and attack us anymore so perhaps we'll be able to arrange a way to take out these invaders it's strange how the Huns are being suddenly aggressive now that Attila's dead. When they had all their forces before, they were relatively content to just hang around and make the odd raid. We're basically going to not engage them for now because we might be able to get a situation where they split up and we can take out these armies one by one, which will be much easier. So we're really just going to wait to see if we can get that going. Next with Anisius, I'm basically just going to continue moving south to attack the Sassanids. We do see some Lachmid forces sneaking towards us up there in the northeast, but we're just going to ignore them. Alexandria should be able to hold itself for a little bit of time. So we can move south to besiege the Sassanid army inside the settlement. The settlement also has a full stack garrison, so this isn't a very favourable situation, but I'm sure Anisius believes he can deal with this, being completely unexperienced and knowing that he's uh, coming into inheritance of a very powerful army that can probably do great things, he just doesn't know exactly what. So we're just going to leave that siege going for now to see if the enemy will sally and we can fight a normal battle, because I think that would be more favourable. And then Julianus has some options here. With the Huns so weakened, we do have chances to attack and perhaps take their territory or bring down their armies, but it's still not going to be completely easy. He's still facing two and a half stacks of Huns around the area, so he does need to be careful here. So while it may be a chance for glory, it's not going to be quite as simple as he might like. However, we do have a chance in the form of this encamped army. It's not close enough to the army off to the right there that they will reinforce. So that means we can attack the fort and do a fort siege style battle, which may give us an advantage against the Huns because it gives them an incentive to stay still in the battle in order to maintain their position in the fort. And when the Huns are still, their big cataphract and horse archer advantage is going to be lessened. They do have some decent regular infantry and of course they have large onagers, so we do need to be tactical and careful here. But with an appropriate battle and an appropriate strategy, we may be able to take this army down with sufficiently low losses that we can then go and take more armies down and perhaps actually conquer their territory and finally give Julianus that glory he's looking for. Spending his final months in Alexandria, Constans made various provisions to ensure his own sons would retain prominent positions in the Roman military. His first son Septimus was named as the new patriarch of his family, passing over his brothers despite them being far better known to the people. His second son, Anisius, was given, somewhat forcibly, command of all the forces previously beholden to Constance, and given the mission to continue the conquests of his father, conquests he had not been following, but was at least partially interested to try his hand at. For the third son came nothing but estates, for Constance had come to think little of him. The father disdained the ease with which the son had become a servant of his rivals in the Senate. That's it for now, thank you so much for watching of course, we will be seeing whether we can hold on without Constance and what new opportunities the death of Attila might bring us in the next episode of Fields of Mars.